But our first presentation will be from Professor Kate Nash, who's Professor of Sociology at Goldsmiths College in London. Uh, her work is on the sociology of human rights, on cultural politics, political sociology, feminist theory, citizenship, social movements, equality and diversity, a wide range of topics. Uh, she's published a number of books, including The Cultural Politics of Human Rights, Comparing the US and the UK, which came out from Cambridge University Press, uh, the, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, a dozen years ago, Universal Difference, Feminism, and the Liberal Undecidability of Women, and looking down the long list of uh, published articles in, uh, in leading academic journals, uh, one title in particular stands out uh, in Theory, Culture, and Society 2007, Interview with Nancy Fraser. Uh, so we're very uh, keen to hear uh, what uh, Kate has to say, and uh, please give her a very warm welcome. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me, and um, it's a great uh, honor to be here to celebrate the uh, work of Nancy Fraser, whose work has been um, so important and so influential to many of us, and sometimes, as I'm going to talk about, in fact, in this talk, um, in ways that have not necessarily been properly appreciated and which I've come to realize myself, the influence of her work over my own thinking in ways that I hadn't really realized. Um, and I've, and I've, I'm sort of very heartened by the um, talks that we've just heard. And I think that, that the aim of sociology in this kind of way of thinking about critical theory, the critical theoretical methodology is to add the social weightedness, if I can kind of borrow that phrase, it's not social weightlessness, but the social weightedness uh, that Lois talked about, and also the kind of how do social, what difference do social movements actually make, and how, how do they, how does that, how do social movements contribute to the way that we think about uh, politics as well as uh, thinking about social movements, uh, which I um, take is a very important aspect of Nancy's um, work. So this um, quotation here, which you may recognize, is from, in trans, uh, from Transnationalizing the Public Sphere, which is a relatively recent piece of work um, uh, that uh, Nancy has uh, written. Um, uh, which is an extended reflection on the usefulness of this uh, concept of the, the public sphere at the global scale. And uh, so you can all read, I know, um, but I'll just sort of quickly read it because that way we'll all be together. Um, so the trick will be to walk a narrow line between two equally unsatisfactory approaches. On the one hand, one should simply avoid an empiricist approach that simply adapts the theory to the existing realities, as that approach risks sacrificing its normative force. On the other hand, one should also avoid an externalist approach that invokes ideal theory to condemn social reality, as that approach risks forfeiting critical traction. The alternative, rather, is a critical theoretical approach that seeks to locate normative standards and emancipatory political possibilities precisely within the historically unfolding constellation. So this is what I want to talk about today, then, this critical theoretical methodology, and it's relevance to sociology, but I suppose also what sociologists have to, co to contribute then to this methodology. And to prepare for this paper and for this symposium, I um, reread uh, some of Nancy's work and with a special pleasure the, the feminist debates that I read as a PhD student in the 1990s. And I was um, very much struck, in fact, by how much I'd been influenced by this methodology almost learning it as a kind of craft in some way. So while I was reading these debates as theory, with a sort of theoretical part of my brain, in another way I was also picking up a particular approach to studying um, the, the, the social and political, um, a Fraserian approach to studying um, the world. And what I want to do now is to outline um, this approach, this critical theoretical methodology, as I am now kind of understanding it, as I'm now interpreting it, um, particularly uh, drawing on the article um, from Redistribution to Recognition, Dilemmas of Justice in a Post-Socialist -Social Age, which Nancy famously debated with um, Judith Butler, Axel Honneth and others. 
I'm not saying that this is the only methodology that Nancy uses. I wouldn't like to do that. Um, and it doesn't fit precisely the, uh, the argument in rethinking of the public sphere that's been so influential, nor precisely the article on transnationalizing the public sphere. But I think those, both those articles do share some elements of this method methodology. OK, so. Um, so here's another quote. This is not going to be all quotes. This is the last big quote, um, which is from uh, the article from Redistribution to Recognition. And the, uh, what I'm looking at here in this quote is the distinction between thought and reality, which I think is a, was a very bold distinction to make in the 1990s for various uh, reasons in terms of those feminist debates, which were so much influenced by post-structuralism and post-postmodernism uh, post, uh, post also. And um, I, I think this is one of the clearest statements um, of the kind of, um, of the methodology uh, in, 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 that uh, she makes. She doesn't really discuss methodology, I think, elsewhere, um, just kind of touching on it. So, again, I know you can read, but um, so in the real world, of course, culture and political economy are always imbricated with one another, and virtually every struggle against injustice, when properly understood, implies demands for both redistribution and recognition. Nevertheless, for heuristic purposes, analytical distinctions are indispensable. Only by abstracting from the complexities of the real world can we devise a conceptual schema that can illuminate it. Thus, by distinguishing redistribution and recognition analytically and by exposing their distinctive logics, I aim to clarify and begin to resolve some of the central political dilemmas of our age. So now I want to unpack this quote. Um, and it seems to me that it has, uh, within this this, just this quote, there, uh, there, are, there is this analytic distinction between thought and reality, which sort of has within it, I think, uh, two different levels of social reality and three of thought, or at least this way is of, of understanding this distinction is compatible with, uh, with, this, um, with Nancy's kind of thought here. So the first, is, the first level is then thought, or what sociologists more commonly think of as meaning. And this itself has a normative dimension, but also an emotional and an embodied dimension. So at the, and it is the, um, the idea that thought and meaning are entwined at the micro level. So culture, meaning, thought, and structural economy are always imbricated with each other. And this is the, uh, I think, the, um, is is, is captured by the idea that as we go around in the world, we're both thinking, feeling, and acting all the time. We're reflexive subjects who are uh, making reality. It's the idea of the social construction of reality at this uh, micro level. The second level, then, is the idea that political thought itself is real. Um, it's real in that it's generated in and through practices in which reflexive subjects organize collectively aim to change the world. Um, what uh, uh, individuals in social movements are involved in is not just uh, strategic thought, how best to achieve aims, uh, nor practical know-how, how to network, how to publicize, how to organize, but it also concerns ideals. So in uh, the article uh, from Redistribution to Recognition, it's the idea that uh, these are the ideals of movements, uh, that, that in every case demands for justice are both for re re redistribution and recognition. Thirdly, then, we come to the analytic thought, the idea that thought is abstraction from reality, that, uh, that the developing of ideal types enables reflection on reality. And this has two uh, aspects, I think. The first is the reflection on normative ideals, or the normative reflection on ideals, which the, the first two papers were largely uh, concerned with. What is the political? How, what, how should we think about it? Uh, what, uh, what are the uh, consequences of thinking of justice in a certain ways, and so on? But I think there's also a, uh, a further aspect of abstraction, abstracting from reality in order to, um, in order to reflect on, um, uh, on, on political ideals, which is about their appropriateness to a particular historical conjuncture. And this requires an assessment of that conjuncture. So we might say a kind of empirical assessment of ideals, an, an assessment of how effective ideals might be given a particular historical conjuncture. And we heard, uh, I think Lois was getting at some of that in, when she was talking about um, 
the, uh, the um, ideas that people are really embodied, there is social domination, there is a kind of uh, way in which um, ideals are not simply, uh, they just won't work because we, we want them to work. So um, now what I found particularly um, helpful, I think, it, um, looking back, is the way in which um, Nancy developed and argued for ideal types on pragmatic grounds. And she sidestepped, I think, questions of epistemology, which were so vexed in uh, feminist debates of that time, so tied up with questions of identity and politics, um, and so much uh, tied up with what we can know and what we can't know, and so on. Um, and she also sidestepped battles over identity politics in terms of, uh, by building on Weber, I think, in separating out political and, if you like, scientific commitments, the way that we go about knowing about uh, the world. So we might say that the contingent foundations of her thought lie in historically, political, historically specific political practice that of the social movements which, um, particularly those which emerged, although actually we should say that were renewed, since they all had much longer histories than was then known about in the late 60s. So they, her thought had foundations in social movements in that the questions she addressed, as in this article that I'm dealing with, were those in which she was directly involved and emerged out of the dilemmas that activists faced and their attempts to clarify the values for which they um, stood. It was also founded there in that it was, um, I think, I take it, uh, largely as members of social movements in the widest sense in which teacher, teaching and research is linked to the possibility of radical social change that Nancy addressed other academics. And in this sense, the feminist debates were not separable of that time, were not separable from social movements. Although it's important to note that the part of is crucial here, that academics are part of social movements, academics are not social movements. Um, social movements consist of networks of organizations, groups, and individuals which have at least some connection to the grassroots and to protest events. So social movements have to extend outside of the university in order to count as a social movement. Um, and the most obvious addressees are those who were sympathetic, at the very least, to uh, socialist feminism uh, in those, uh, in those uh, articles, in those debates. Uh, but there were also other kind of fellow travellers of the new left, if you like, especially those involved in labour politics, anti-racism and so on. And more recently in her work, she's addressed uh, questions of, um, that are relevant to uh, movements for uh, global social justice. So now I'm going to turn to the, this, the, the importance of this methodology, I think, to sociology and the way in which sociology, if you like, can then contribute also to debates in political theory. Um, one of the things that we can say about sociology that I think is we, we would largely agree with is that, um, is that following Zygmunt Bauman, sociology has changed from being a practice of legislators in, its, in the work of its founding fathers to that of interpreters. Sociologists, and perhaps more generally the sociologically minded, insofar as sociology has informed policy making, which it, it once did, are no longer legislators, sure of their knowledge, confident that they can uncover laws of social life. And this project was, of course, linked, uh, closely linked to modernizing pro projects realized through the state. As Bauman argues, the sociologically minded now have the much more modest role of interpreters, translating across different knowledges and between imagined communities. So then what is the role of critique? And sociology has an inherent tendency towards relativism. Um, to show how facts and norms are socially constructed is to dissolve their claims to universal truth and value. So then if social construction is all there is, if that's the role of sociology to effectively say to um, different imagined communities, your community is imagined, or what you hold to be dear is actually historically specific and uh, related to particular social uh, structures and social norms, then what happens to questions of value? What happens to the basis of critique, if you like? On what basis can critique of existing dimensions of power and resources be made? And probably the most uh, common approach in sociology 
even if it's not been dominant in the, in the more recent times, it's certainly um, going to rise again, I think. And it has been, um, it's a continual temptation, I think, for sociologists, is what Nancy calls the externalist approach. And the, if you'll uh, remember, in fact, we can go back. Um, externalist approaches um, invoke theory to condemn social reality. And sociology, uh, these kind of externalist approaches are perennial in sociology. So I think that, that uh, the work of Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu is an example of an externalist approach, although it's complicated, but it, it is nevertheless an externalist approach. Um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And it seems to me that this type of approach is, is, is invariably tempting for sociologists and will, is sort of, again, tempting, particularly as we're faced with the financial crisis and the restructuring of state and society that we're undoubtedly uh, going through now. Um, it is a, it's a, temp a continual temptation. So, for example, there's a, a new edited collection by Duzinus and Zizek called The Idea of Communism, which is a philosophical reflection on the need for a Marxist utopia, for example, that is a kind of, I think, an indication of the way in which this type of uh, externalist critique will become more prominent now as we are facing this kind of radical attack on, uh, on, uh, on the public um, sector and on um, people's kind of uh, lives and well-being. These kind of approaches, um, I think, adopt what uh, we can uh, call a form of ideology critique, even if those words are used a great deal. But the, the, f the form of ideology critique that they take is that, um, is that of the criticism of received wisdom as supporting domination and the unveiling of the conditions that cause both domination and its ideological reproduction with, of course, the purpose of emancipation. There is a range of theoretical problems of associated with this type of approach. A common theoretical problem that's rehearsed by uh, sociologists is that it treats uh, social actors as cultural dopes, uh, as uh, Garfinkel um, puts it, as having no resources for thinking their situation because their thought and actions are determined by social structures. As I say, that's more complicated in the case of Bourdieu, but it's nevertheless there. And it's compounded by the way in which externalist approaches situate the sociologists themselves as somehow able to escape the determinism of social conditions that must logically also affect them. So sociologists in this model have a true perspective, while that of all other actors is socially and historically determined. But as I noticed, uh, Nancy's criticism, as I noted, Nancy's criticism of externalist approaches to critique is quite specific. They lack traction, that's the, uh, uh, the uh, claim, which is to say that they are unpersuasive. They effectively open up an epistemological gap between the privileged social theorists and the victims whose situation they theorize. So leaving aside the theoretical inconsistencies and contradictions of ideology critique, from a pragmatist point of view, the question becomes, how do critical theorists influence those who are subject to domination to bring them to understand their position of that of a, of a victim of the system? And as uh, Luke Boltanski strikingly puts it of Bourdieu's theory of class and distinction, and I'm translating loosely here, if you try to persuade someone in love that what they feel is simply a function of the fact that their loved one is of a higher social class than themselves, you're likely to have some problems in getting to them to admit it. And that's from De La Critique, which is um, soon coming out in On Critique, as On Critique in Britain. So my, what I want to say here is that from the pragmatist point of view, it's through the link to social movements that critique gains traction. As I said, social movements themselves work on normative ideals, on what they stand for, as well as on strategies and know-how. Nevertheless, the main task of social movements is to persuade. To persuade, uh, is, is to persuade. So to reframe, their main task is, uh, is kind of twofold, I think. To reframe ideas, images, events, and processes in terms that facilitate progressive social change, 
So to reframe, for example, gender inequality as a matter of injustice rather than of nature, of structure rather than misfortune, a matter for politics rather than fate. So to reframe um, things that are naturalized in some way as matters of injustice. And then secondly, to make uh, ideals of justice popular when at first they sound odd or just plain wrong, sometimes through more or less rational debate, but also by other means. And um, things like fashion, image, coolness, and so on play a large role in consumer societies like ours in persuasion. Uh, and an example here would be the fair trade movement, which effectively encodes a transnational socioeconomic connection and responsibility for the distant suffering of small farmers through brand recognition. Uh, there's, there's a sort of idea um, of uh, uh, sort of um, good consumerism becomes um, a way of participating in justice. Social movements persuade, uh, first, uh, first of all by, uh, and perhaps above all, by enlarging their own networks um, uh, through, uh, ideally until they dissolve altogether. So social movements rarely achieve what they want to, but the conflicts in which they are involved may nevertheless become part of the mainstream. And arguably this is what's happened to the women's movement, of course not on terms of our own choosing. Also through different forms of the media, including the mediated public sphere, um, on occasion, um, in consultation with governments, political parties, through the courts, and of course through demonstration and protest. So my argument here is that the role of sociology is to feed these movements. Um, that there is a, a contribution that sociologists, as indeed political theorists, have to make for, um, uh, to these social movements. And of course, the, uh, the role of the sociologist is different from that of the political theorist. We're not well equipped, particularly, to interrogate and refine normative ideals. So I'm going to now talk um, sort of more concretely, concretely about the way in which, um, and I have to take my examples here from the sociology of human rights, but I, I think you'll probably be familiar with a lot of the um, sort of examples. Um, so the way in which sociology can contribute, for example, to human rights movements, um, which, are, um, which are, of course, complex and arguably various and certainly wide-ranging. So in the first uh, way, then, I think what uh, sociologists have to contribute to uh, social movements is to investigate the way in which meaning and uh, reality are entwined in practice in everyday situations in small face-to-face -face encounters, what uh, Gary Fryne and Brooke Harrington call tiny publics, uh, water cooler moments, you might say, and also in larger scale uh, mediated publics. So an example here from the uh, sociology of human rights would be um, that it would be um, helpful to social movements, uh, to movements for rights, for human rights, to understand how human rights are negotiated and understood at the local level in face-to-face -face encounters or, in, uh, or also in national mediated publics. So in the UK, for example, it, uh, surveys report that most people are in favour of human rights. And it's hard to imagine people saying that they're not in favour of human rights uh, faced with the survey questions. But this is completely at odds with the populist media coverage of human rights, which uh, regularly um, kind of take courts to task, particularly for defending the rights or, or of unpopular minorities, most notably of refugees, migrants, and so on, the very people that are in need of human rights. To the point where the government has indeed pledged to repeal the uh, Human Rights Act, which is the way that the European um, Convention gets into British law. So one of the uh, things that I think sociologists would have to contribute here is to look at the way in which people argue about human rights in face-to-face -face situations or indeed in, in media arguments. How is authority constructed in those situations? How do people win arguments uh, at, this, at this kind of level? Is it through retelling narratives from the media? Is it through personal experience? What kind of arguments do they make one way or the other? What's the, what kind of arguments seem to work when people um, disagree? 
And this is, I think, a very a, a sort of useful thing to do because um, if, as I've argued, social movements are involved in persuasion, then they need to know what they're, you know, what they're working on, if you like, and, and arguably what they're working with. Um, secondly, the, the question of uh, what political ideals uh, mean to different social movements. Um, so this can be from a sort of straightforward uh, mapping to analysis. It's not in terms of, um, it's not, it's not the, the sort of way that political theorists contribute, I think, not so much in terms of the validity of justifications or the way of analyzing justifications, but more in terms of what are the actual effects on mobilization of thinking of justice in a certain way, for example. So in the, in the, in the case of human rights, there's, uh, it, it's um, sort of interesting and um, relevant to, to ask, do human rights necessarily, do human rights movements necessarily tend towards legalization? Do they see justice um, as realized by human rights as only possible through legalization? Or is that a, a sort of, um, artifact, if you like, of the way in which human rights are talked about in the mainstream and also the way in which people study human rights. It's only at the moment that there's questions of institutionalization that human rights come to be uh, seen as relevant. So, and this may not be the case for mobilization at the grassroots level. It may not be that human rights always tend towards law, which does have uh, big disadvantages for grassroots movements um, uh, that are quite obvious. And then thirdly, um, it's the third kind of level, skipping over the kind of normative reflection on ideals, um, there is the uh, question of how appropriate to the current conjuncture. And obviously that's a huge question then. Then you're really raising questions of macro uh, social theoretical um, so, uh, sort of questions, questions of, um, yeah, at a, at a sort of large scale, a, a large sort of general scale. But an example here would be, um, the, uh, the question of whether states are the kind of things, even when they're constitutional states, even when they have constitutions, even when they've taken in human rights, if you like, human rights norms have become national, whether states, which are seen as the main, uh, the ways in which uh, uh, human rights can be guaranteed, whether in fact that is possible, whether states actually are constituted in, a, in such a way as to be able to guarantee human rights. Um, and uh, what would that actually mean? And that would include the human rights of non-citizens then, uh, well, it would include, include the rights of non-citizens as well as citizens. What would it actually mean for states to do that? So, um, okay, so, um, so, what, so my suggestion is that the way that I've understood uh, what Nancy um, uh, uh, kind of uh, offers in terms of this critical theoretical methodology then is critical theory as the handmaiden of social movements. Um, and what I, uh, the, way, the way in which is, this is then relevant to so for sociology, which sort of goes between these temptations of a kind of relativist dissolving of questions of truth and value, and on the other hand, the externalist approach, which sort of confirms sociologists in their priestly vocation of condemning uh, social reality on the basis of theoretical, uh, theoretical constructions is that it offers a model and a rationale for intellectual um, engagement in politics that separates politics and scholarship whilst kind of putting them together in some way. And it also connects, I think, their normative values and ideals with empirical research in a way that is, I think, very important for sociologists who, who, are, who find that very uh, tricky in, in many ways. And above all, then, I think it gives a very clear sense of a project for sociologists. If we're no longer legislators, if we're no longer, uh, well, for a very long time, in fact, not, uh, th there is no real interest in sort of applying sociology, um, then it's also a way of sociologists becoming, uh, maintaining relevance in a world that's increasingly inclined to deny it. Okay, thank you.